The works in the exhibition are selected over a period of 15, 20 years on and off. It's a large body of work. I make many series of works. So there's the earlier works, which were basically the early exposed paintings, identified forms, the shellac works, the repetition paintings, and then right through the whole body of exposed paintings, which has been the bigger body of work within the series of works. Some of the series I go back and forward into, the shellac paintings I left aside for um, four or five years and then returned to them if I felt I could take it any further forward. So they all feed into one another. And the hard thing about doing an exhibition like this is trying to find the lineage in the work. So it's interesting to actually be reflective on it and actually spend this process over a year just looking through all this body of work. I have over three and a half thousand images of work since 1989. That includes paper works, watercolours, whatever. And I started last September shaking my head when I realised what the kind of project we're involved in here with, with the publication and also with the show. And literally for four weeks just sat on the computer and pulled out transparencies and just looked at every image. And when I say there's three and a half thousand images, there is three and a half thousand images. But I'm very fortunate that my wife's a photographer, so we photograph everything. Three quarters of these works don't exist. They've been destroyed or they've moved on. Or... So it's, it's been an interesting process actually finding it out and also tracking where the works are, because earlier on you never record if something's destroyed, you just destroyed it. You know, does that work exist? No, it doesn't. You know, and it's been quite an interesting process just finding out. There's a piece in the exhibition from memory, which is a key work, where I actually took the, an image of a wild cucumber plant, a linear drawing, and made it a motif and sank it into the corrugated cardboard. So it became part of the corrugation, it became part of itself, it became an object. So it had its own intrinsic history and quality. And that was a very important moment for me where I realised that the paintings, and I can go on to contradict this later on, um, didn't have to be full of gestures, didn't have to be full of marks, which the previous work was. In a way, the earlier work was draining me of everything and I couldn't take anything further forward. So that from that moment, I realised that I could actually paint an image, whether I sank it into corrugation or whether I painted it initially onto oil paper, I could then dissolve it off. So I still started with the point where I had an image to get to where I am now. So it became a natural development from on these tall pieces of... Um, oil paper, I would paint an image of a leaf or an organic form and then I would take turpentine and quite loosely just dissolve it off. So I would go back into the materiality of the oil paper. The oil paper had, you know, it was a wax paper where I then painted, put a surface on, put an image onto, then I dissolved the paint off the surface and then the wax off the paper. So I was going back into the object itself. And it slowly developed from there where you know, the earlier paintings, there was more turpentine involved and things were quite loose. But if you lit turpentine, if you pour turpentine, it just meanders down a canvas. So there were certain systems set up in my head where it'd be quite rigorous. I'd either make a line from the top to the bottom and then release turpentine. So I always had a channel down it with repetition paintings in particular. Um, with this painting, the whole painting is covered with, you know, with a dark grey oil paint. And really from the bottom to the top I made the painting, which when you look at it, it's kind of what? It looks like it's flown down. In fact, it starts off with brushes of turpentine stretching from the bottom to the top of the, the canvas. And eventually the paint, the turpentine starts to flow down. So there's a movement and there's a gravity involved, but it's how you control the gravity. So you can see the actual brush marks where the brush is actually risen through the painting. But it's also what is quite interesting about this painting is that I can actually, it's almost like the earlier paper works where I'm going back through a layer of paint, back through a slightly dry paint, and then into the gesso surface itself. So in a way, I'm revealing what is hidden. In the titling of the work, and I never make reference to anything or any object or any landscape or any part of my life. Um, it's very important that um, for the viewer, things are kept very open. But in discussion with, and it's something that you know, I'm aware of, but other people can make more reference to. And I was with a, a contemporary and a friend who you know, he knows my lifestyle and knows exactly what we do. He knows that I go for walks most weekends down the East Coast. 
and you know it's very apparent he you know the, the light is in the painting especially the resonance paintings and they're about the vastness of the sky really and how the you know the east coast it's very particular the light here there's a kind of clarity in the light which you don't get in many other places although in the winter you get no light it's um it's there's something about just the size, the body of the lights in the resonance paintings, and it also in other paintings, the exposed paintings, even when you get the, the strong violets or the dark um, oxides or the orange oxides, there's a bit of everything, you know, from this area. But they're not landscape paintings, and they're not about landscape painting. To me, you know, it's a luxury having a studio which is full of light. I come in here every day and um, although I'm not, I try to reinvent in my head what I'm doing each day. Otherwise, you know, you, there's certain demands of certain things that you need to do, but also you, for me personally, I've got to pitch myself at the right time to start painting. So I might start painting early in the morning, but I might start painting late in the afternoon. And you really end up with a two or three hour period of concentration. And then the rest of it is the mundane thing, like cleaning the brushes, making sure the palette's right. But all these things are important in the, the body of the work. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a matter of um, just setting the time and the place and the moment to make a painting. Different paintings are different. You have the resonance paintings, which in a way are very cathartic paintings, because whereas the other paintings, although I work in them at different times, now, earlier I didn't, the resonance paintings I have to make in one go and the paintings have to be made over several hours. So sometimes they can go on for 12 hours without stopping because the paint has to be wet and it has to be moving. So it's one mark after And you have to really set yourself up emotionally and, um, and be in the right frame of mind because you know you're going to be sitting at something for up to 12, 13 hours, whatever. Yeah. These exposed paintings um, more recently have been built up over several layers. In the earlier works, the black that was taken off was made up of many oxides and I would just take it off once and the colours would reveal themselves. In the more recent paintings, and particularly the ones that we're showing at the fruit market, the, the dioxin violet ones, um, a dioxin violet has gone on first over the painting. While it's wet, I've painted a lamp black or a vine black through the painting. And then I've made a single line out of the painting from bottom to top to find the division and the proportion I wish. And then I've slowly stripped from the bottom to the top with a, with a wide brush, taking a layer of paint off. So you go back to the initial dioxin underneath the black. Now the first time you do it, the dioxin is very weak and very light in colour. So I then repaint the entire painting by putting a dioxin across the painting again and repeat the process. And it depends how many times, how deep or how intense I want the painting to be, how many times I'll go back into that process. So you end up with something that's one, hopefully ret retains a fragility, which is very important in the paintings. And also a kind of organic sense in this painting particularly, because there's a flow. And it depends how clean I keep the turpentine. If I reuse the dirty turpentine, it re-adds the pigment. So this painting has been built up over eight, I think about eight layers, over a period of about three months. Um, and it's still drying. But the paintings appear to be quite clinical and quite precise, in fact they're incredibly chaotic in the process. So there's many things in the actual making of a painting which can go wrong. But then also, reflectively, over a period of a few days after a painting is maybe complete, you look at the painting, you're trying to work out if it is actually doing what I think it's doing. Is it spiralling? Is the space moving within the painting? Because for something as quite static as a painting, or the perceived staticness of something which is a rectangle, basically an exposed painting with an area coming off it, the painting is only working when the space starts to spiral, in that case that the eye is drawn round the painting from one point to another. And it takes a while sometimes to work out if that's happening in the work. And then there's a period of, let's say, gestation with the painting where it maybe sits in the studio, it's maybe packed or it's maybe pushed against another painting. And then you come to photograph the painting and you see the painting in a very clear, different light because you haven't been with that painting for a while. And then you can see again if it's working. And so there's all these moments in time when a painting is constructed and I still feel that it, the painting is still being constructed through these points of editing to the point that the actual painting exists beyond the familiarity of the studio.
said earlier on that you know for a long time I denied the fact that the artist's hand should be involved in the work, but I used that as my head and a vehicle to take the work forward, and it was a falsehood. The actual truth is that it's all about hand, it's about gesture and it's about emotion. But the more I discuss that issue or bring that issue into the work, it becomes more difficult to make work. I think it should be up to other people if they decide it's about this and that.